2020 vision in a time of crisis. Uh, before we begin, I just want to give a word of thanks to our sponsors. The event is presented by the Columbia Maison Francaise, and we want to thank uh, Shani uh, Piers for all of her work. It's co-sponsored by the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society, by the Columbia Global Centers, Paris, uh, the Columbia Center for Contemporary Critical Thought, the European Institute, and the Alliance Program. Now, after presentations by our uh, guests and, and interveners, there will be a question and answer. And please put your questions using the question and answer function of this Zoom webinar in French or in English, and we'll try to get to them. I'll be mo moderating and trying to move the discussion swiftly, trying to keep time. We have an extraordinary panel assembled today. Uh, let me present everyone quickly. Uh, of course, you know them all, uh, but let me present them to you quickly and let me ask them to uh, come on the uh, webinar now as I present them, please, uh, by turning on their video. Um, Etienne Balibar, uh, of course, uh, you know well, we were just in conversation. So I, uh, I invite you uh, to all to turn on your videos, welcome. Um, Etienne Balibar is one of the world's leading philosophers and the author of remarkable work, uh, philosophical and political texts, such as, of course, uh, with the Althusser Collective, uh, Reading Capital, to Spinoza and Politics, to Equal Liberty. A professor here at Columbia and also at Kingston University, he taught for many years at the uh, revolutionary university Paris 10 Nanterre. Uh, we're also joined by Suleiman Bashir Diagn, who is a professor in the departments of French and philosophy and the director of the Institute of African Studies at Columbia University. His areas of research and publication include history of philosophy, history of logic and mathematics, Islamic philosophy, African philosophy, and literature. His latest publications in English include The Ink of the Scholars, Reflections on Philosophy in Africa, Open to Reason, Muslim Philosophers in Conversation with Western Tradition, and In Search of Africa's S, Universalism and Decolonial Thought. Uh, our third uh, guest is Emmanuel Sada, who teaches French and history at Columbia University and is currently the Carnoy Family Chair of Contemporary Civilization. Her work has focused mostly on the history of French imperialism and colonialism, and notably on issues of race and citizenship, as well as on post-colonial immigration to France. She's the author, among others, among other books of uh, the signature book, Empire's Children, race, filiation, and citizenship in the French colonies. And Adam Tuz uh, is the Catherine and Shelby Colum Davis Professor of History and Director of the European Institute here at Columbia University. He's best known for his history of the 2008 financial crisis and its aftermath, uh, That uh, a book that appeared in 2018, a landmark tome called Crashed, How a Decade of Financial Crises Changed the World. So now we've all been experiencing uh, another wave of shock, this time from Louisville, Kentucky last night with, uh, with the impunity granted to the police officers who killed Breonna Taylor. And I'd like to start by discussing with you first uh, the movement for black lives uh, in this country and, and globally. Uh, we've seen uh, the, the extensions and the, the, the ramifications of that movement across the globe. And the question I'd like to pose, and, and maybe uh, Emmanuel, you could start us off uh, with, uh, with your thoughts on this, is how uh, is the movement for Black lives in the United States and around the world affecting domestic politics, both in the United States, in France, and elsewhere, uh, as well as global politics? How is it interacting with the rise of extreme right, proto-fascist, or right populist movements uh, around the world? Um, Emmanuel, would you uh, want to start us off in our discussion on that um, uh, in order to then I'll, then, I'll then turn to maybe Etienne and Bashir to kind of uh, respond. And sure, yes. I'll try. Um, but um, before I answer your question, Bernard, I first would like to thank uh, the organizers and, and, and most notably Shani and uh, Fanny for their invitations. Also, I would like maybe to say a few uh, a few words about the kind of work that we are doing here, rather that some of my colleagues are doing here. Uh, we have an hour and a half for you know debating all these 
uh, important issues. Um, I'd like to actually uh, quote maybe the blurb that was describing our panel, right? That all the issues that were um, mentioned in the announcement for our panel, the COVID-19 pandemic and public health crisis, economic collapse, waves of anti-racist protests, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and how, to, how can we make sense of the current moment of, of, of in history? So I think uh, it's, it's a banality to say so, but I would like to take one minute to, uh, to, to, on, the, on this issue. I think um, one important dimension of a crisis is that it challenges our grids of intelligibility because obviously of some kind of irreducible dimension of contingency, right? So um, I think that one of the things that the current crisis or the, 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 the connected crisis in the plural uh, have revealed is that uh, the traditional academic discourses, especially in the social sciences, have been inoperative to make sense of the current moment, right? The, 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 the call for this panel was how do we make sense of the current moment? At least those discourses have been inoperative in isolation. And the categories of analysis, the different distinction between the fields, the partage du sensible, as uh, Rancière would say, uh, which structures that works, which structures that their work seems inadequate to make sense of our present, uh, and I would say even more so the uh, intense acceleration and convergence of different crises in 2020 seems to be calling for new ways to, uh, to for new ways of making sense of the of the moment, right? So. Uh, in that context, I would like to tell uh, my immense admiration for people like Etienne and Adam, who have been trying, uh, I think, you know, throughout the past year, I mean, for years now, but even more visibly, at least visibly to me, because I've been reading them more than ever in the past uh, few months, they have been trying to make sense of, of the moment, right? Said intelligare, to go back to Spinoza and Etienne's work last week, more than ever, it is an ethical and a political injunction uh, one that comes for that comes with uh, psychological benefits i think for us who are on the privileged side of the educational divide but the one that is obviously central to uh, what we're doing here as you know academics and, and intellectuals um, and so uh, it's it's it benefit for us it's a, it's a burden for them right i think it's a burden for people like etienne and adam who have, again, uh, relentlessly trying to make sense of the current situation in the past few months because of the very fluidity of this situation, right? So they have to not only work all the time to try to understand what happens, right, on, 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 uh, in sense, in, on the moment, but also they risk uh, constantly, they risk uh, being wrong, right, at any given moment. So uh, I think this burden requires our immense gratitude for this kind of work. So. Was a little as, a, as, a, as a, an introduction, but um, thank you. Okay. Mm, yeah, thank you. Um, so, uh, Etienne, any 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 rea initial reactions as we open this first part of the uh, of the discussion? Okay. Um, okay. I will not repeat uh, uh, what uh, uh, Emmanuel said. Uh, in terms of, and you said in terms of uh, thanking you all, um, I'm delighted to be in your company and I share everything that, uh, all the feelings that have been uh, said. I just add one little thing, which is that uh, um, we are all members of the so-called Columbia family or <laughs> Columbia community, which is something that, uh, of course, carries a lot of commonality among uh, all us. But at the same time, I believe we come from different places. We do not belong to the same uh, disciplines. We do not exactly have the same lives or uh, political and social uh, experiences. And I very much hope that this will uh, appear as a, as, a, as a resource in the in the current discussion. Uh, so this is to say that, of course, my point of view is limited, but I, okay. Um, now, uh, you, uh, um, you introduced the discussion directly and straightforwardly mm -hmm. by uh, asking us to react to the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. And I thank you for that because uh, 
uh, I agree that this is, of course, part of the situation. Uh, I'm speaking from France, so I might, you might imagine that I fear a little uh, uh, far away from that. Whereas on the contrary, I, I, I perceive it as something that is extremely important also for us uh, here. Now, in a, in a paper that I had, uh, first a lecture I, I gave at uh, Berkeley College in July and then uh, expanded it as, as a paper in the French uh, online uh, uh, press, I, 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 I insisted on something which I want to repeat. Uh, of course, uh, 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 Black Lives Matter is first and primarily about Black lives. I mean, so, so we should uh, uh, first acknowledge, and this is part of the uh, importance of the movement, that um, um, uh, the citizens, the black men and women, and even children uh, who take part in the demonstrations, and today they are, they are again de demonstration, demonstrating powerfully because of the outrage that they rightly uh, feel. You mentioned that about the uh, uh, decision in the Brona Taylor uh, uh, case. They are, in a sense, they're, they're fighting for their lives. I mean, they are fighting for their lives in their in the extended, in the in the broad uh, sense, physically, of course, and uh, um, uh, but also, of course, uh, uh, socially, morally. I'll return to the moral aspect of this uh, question uh, briefly. So, um, so we um, a long history or experience, I would say, of uh, being uh, confronted as what I am. That is. Uh, uh, an old white man. I mean, I, I used to be young at some time, but <laughs> uh, uh, an academic, an intellectual, but also somebody who tried to uh, to uh, uh, take part in 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 in, in broader uh, movements, uh, taught me that you never ought to to appropriate the cause of the other as. Jacques Rancière, uh, uh, in a, <laughs> whom you mentioned a moment ago, had famously written about our experience in the uh, uh, War of Independence of uh, uh, Algeria. So I never tried to appropriate the uh, uh, cause of uh, uh, the Black people whose lives so much uh, matter. But at the same time, I believe it's Im important to uh, uh, recognize not only that uh, uh, this uh, struggle is uh, is, uh, is, uh, is 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 full. I mean, is expresses uh, uh, absolutely uh, uh, a decisive or central uh, um, uh, political and moral issues, which are universal. I mean, have a universal importance. But more than that, or more concretely than that, the fact that uh, um, not by chains, of course. Uh, uh, the demonstrations they are uh, 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 making now, uh, right in this moment, have produced like uh, waves around them, uh, rallying people, some of which had already, of course, uh, 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 often uh, supported their cause, but others who are relatively uh, uh, new. And suddenly we have the feeling that uh, uh, the struggle is also uh, 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 carrying a vital, I would say, uh, uh, meaning or importance in the current uh, uh, conjuncture. And I'll stop there, but I believe that uh, uh, this has to do with, uh, uh, in a sense, the, the coalescence or the, the, the uh, bringing together of two uh, important things. On one side, uh, part of the uh, reasons for this uh, resonance is the awareness and uh, of the extent to which uh, uh, this pandemic, uh, this health crisis, uh, which, and I agree with that, concerns everybody on earth, in a sense. I mean, perhaps we might say, and I'm planning to write something on that, that uh, uh, after or during the, uh, uh, as, as, as part of the uh, uh, 
uh, global warming and uh, catastrophe, etc. This adds to the feeling that there exists something like the human species, which uh, 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 in this crisis is both subject and uh, object. I mean, acting and, uh, and 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 suffering. But at the same time, of course, uh, and uh, contrary to some official discourses that we hear, sometimes with goodwill, sometimes with uh, uh, less clear uh, uh, intentions, namely, we're all in the same boat. Uh, so this is not true. I mean, we are not all exactly in the same boat, or there are different levels in the in the in in the boat, and all sorts of inequalities, which include professional inequalities, social inequalities, gender inequalities, racial inequalities, in specific manners uh, uh, in 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 different countries, are coming to the fore as sources of discrimination or renewed discriminations, I would say, uh, not only in terms of uh, professional, but in terms of how they are affected by the uh, uh, pandemic because of their jobs or their joblessness or the places where they live or the necessities of their uh, uh, lives. And also in terms, in fact, of how they are treated by the uh, 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 institution. But conversely, of course, and I, Sorry, I was probably too long. I end with that. What I also wanted, and I keep this idea in mind uh, more than ever uh, today after two or three uh, uh, months, is that this type of crisis, and I'm sure we'll return to these uh, social, economic, uh, uh, and other aspects, also produces a crisis in politics and uh, again, I, I use uh, the term moral in, uh, intentionally, a moral crisis in our very uh, uh, understanding of what it means to be a citizen and to do uh, politics and to be active on our own conditions of uh, living. Of course, in a few weeks, you have your elections. <laughs> That's a terrible uh, uh, test. So, so there, there might be, there might ar ar arrive a feeling of despair, a feeling of powerlessness, a feeling of disorientation. And uh, allow me, I, I know I'm too long, but I allow me to, 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 to add this. I received these very days emails from my former students at Irvine in California or uh, 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 my students in uh, Kingston, uh, London, and several of them use the, the same uh, uh, words. We have a feeling of catastrophe that weighs on uh, uh, us. Will you say something about that? We don't have good words. Of course, we don't have good words. But when we see Black Lives Matter, we can say that there are potentials. Uh, there are potentials of uh, uh, action. I even use the term insurrection in, uh, in, <laughs> in uh, uh, my text, which show that this situation is not pure and simply uh, 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 a situation of uh, crushing and and uh, and incapacity etc so of course i don't believe this is all uh, there are so many other aspects of the crisis and the problems that we face that are not just resolved just by people walk into uh, the streets but if there were no people among the most uh, directly hit by the crisis and, and, and those who in our societies are the most discriminated who launch this kind of uh, uh, movement, we would uh, be uh, uh, unable to imagine the future. Mm -hmm. Yes, Etienne. I mean, uh, the, uh, you know, one thing, one thing I might come back to you uh, before, I'd like to go to Bashir and get some re reactions as well. But I mean, I would want to get back to you because I mean, you've cast it very much as an American phenomenon, which of course, Black Lives Matter is an American phenomenon, but if I understand correctly, it's it's having remarkable insurrectional effects around the world, including in France. I mean, including in France, where right now there's a political transformation that's taking place. Uh, that well, well, okay, well, we'll we'll come back to that. But and 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 elsewhere, I think that there's an appreciation of. There's a there's a there's a way to think about issues that is changing in part because of the because of the uprisings in the United States. But Bashir, let me let me I, I, we want to hear from you too in, um, in in terms of your reactions and thoughts here. I bet you're gonna have to turn on your mic first, okay? So just to unmute quickly. 
precisely, let me continue uh, uh, what you were saying about the, the insurrectional nature of this and the global and insurrectional nature of, this, uh, of these protests and of the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, Etienne has compared it in his writings to what happened with May 68, the global, the becoming global of an insurrection. And I want to consider, because Etienne mentioned something about appropriation, I would like to use a word um, uh, that I like very much, which is translation. Actually, what happened here in the United States with the murder of George Floyd and uh, everything that, that came around it, all the death that uh, uh, happened before that, uh, found resonance in the word meaning that it was translated in the language and the terms of the different places where we saw also this ethical insurrection uh, 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 manifesting itself. In other words, in France, it was translated as the Adama Traore uh, mm -hmm. uh, murder by the police, mm -hmm. and it, it sort of revivified the movement of the Comité Adama Traore in France. You also have uh, uh, different places where things happened and the uh, uh, George Floyd murder and the Black Lives Matter movement found local translation. Let me take a, a, a place which uh, did not uh, call much attention, Tunisia. In Tunisia, in Tunis on Avenue Bourguiba, you had many protests uh, organized by political parties, but also uh, black rights advocate uh, organization, advocacy organization, such as uh, uh, Nenti or uh, an organization called Adam, calling attention because they had, uh, for 40 years actually, they had organized protests against anti-Black racism in Tunisia um, or in, in Maghreb. So this notion that uh, uh, the significance of uh, George Floyd murder went beyond uh, uh, the United States, actually was translated in the language of uh, refusal of iniquity and in ethical insurrection against all forms of racism and inequality and iniquity. This is what happened. So in a way, you have translations in the plural without any original text. Nobody can say this was the original text and it was just uh, a mimetism or contagion which is something that in France was said. I mean, when uh, uh, you had many uh, politicians in France who came and say, oh, oh, oh we, uh, this, this is something that happened in the United States because the United States are the United States and here we are France, we are a republic, our police is Republican. So it looks like the word republic uh, functions as some kind of, of fetish. You just uh, uh, put it out and say it cannot be here because we are a republic. The very notion of the republic was questioned by the people who uh, manifested and protested saying, well, the republic should be the republic for everybody. So this is something that uh, must be said to, to, and I think that the word translation uh, uh, says it much better than any other word like contagion or uh, um, appropriation. And I agree totally with, 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 with Etienne. There is something universal in this ethical insurrection. All the white people who protested, and they were the majority, against these murders and against inequality, protested in the name of something that was personal to them. Something that we should not be uh, 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 fearing to sound naive by calling it a sense of humanity. There is the fact that these pandemics have revealed two things. First of all, a fundamental anthropological difference to use a, a, a concept uh, used by Etienne, which means that there is a radical inequality of human beings in front of uh, uh, illness and death. And this was unacceptable. It, it came on top of many aspects of how anthropological difference is unacceptable. And this is why it, it, it turned into this kind of uh, uh, ethical insurrection everywhere. Nobody was appropriating anything. Everybody was expressing something that comes deep 
from our own sense of humanity, we might not be in the same boat, but we share the same humanity. And that shared humanity is what revolted, what uh, uh, decided that it was time that something ends in this world, which is racism, racism everywhere, not just in the United States or in France, or also in the Maghreb, for example, and in other places where racism is not against necessarily black people, although it looks like uh, black uh, racism is the uh, most shared racism throughout the world and not just in Euro America as well. To come to uh, another, uh, very quickly to another uh, aspect of what you say about the, the extreme right. It is interesting to see that the response of the extreme right, because the extreme right uh, answered, I mean, in terms of uh, uh, putting forward the language of white supremacy and uh, uh, using in particular this uh, 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 narrative of the grand remplacement, the great replacement of white people by brown and black uh, uh, people and othering them. And this was said in, in France, for example, uh, uh, the, the, the Republican notion, you know, the idea that Republicanism is naturally uh, um, a wall against this kind of manifestation, it is interesting to see how Republicanism is used now by the extreme right. And at the same time, people who are expected to be Republicans are imposing in their own discourse the language of the extreme right, making it acceptable. Etienne and myself, uh, uh, we signed uh, an op-ed in Le Monde in sometime in June uh, uh, with other um, 12 intellectuals, as we were called in the presentation of the Tribune we published in Le Monde, uh, uh, complaining that when President Macron spoke about this, he seemed to be condemning uh, anti-racism more than racism itself. I mean, no, no doubt that I mean, nobody would think that uh, Macron would espouse in any way uh, uh, this kind of extreme right discourse. But the extreme right has been uh, efficient enough to just put forward words that are being used now by people who are supposed to be Republican. The word ensauvagement. It looks like all French politicians find the, are trying to find the best possible opportunity to use the word, just to show, to show that they are using it. Just like kids uh, uh, play with, you know, uh, forbidden words and they would say, oh, pipi caca, to, to show how, how transgressive they are. And these people are just trying to use, to uh, uh, create sentences where they would be talking about en sauvagement. And this idea that the word is divided, that you had this anthropological difference between the Republicans and the others, and the others being necessarily sauvage. And there is the en sauvagement possible of the society this is precisely what encourages what is called the systemic, systemic racism because the police, Republican as it is, might start thinking that its role is to police the city against them people. When you have that divide, them people, and we the police have to protect the Republic against them people, then Republican as they may be, you have systemic racism. Yes, thanks, Bashir. Uh, those were really important interventions. I saw, Adam, I saw your two fingers up. Hold on for a second, and I wanted to get back to Emmanuel. I, the notion of translation, I, I, I appreciate very much this effort to find and to coin the right concept. Um, um, the, 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 but the, 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 you, you yourself had this problem of the translation without a text, right? Uh, so, um, the, and there's no doubt that, and contagion all, I, I agree with you that contagion has a negative connotation, which doesn't in any way get at the, at the sense in which there are these filiations, but the interconnectedness of these anti-racist struggles around the world, whether, whether it's in, in France or in, in, in uh, countries in Africa or or in the United States is the thing that we're trying to get at here, I think, right? Which we saw also in 2011 as well, right? There was Occupy Wall Street and then there was uh, the Arab Revolution and there were all of the, there was, a, there were moments of insurrection that were, that were, that were interconnected. And actually part of what we're seeing now is, is in part in, interconnected with 
of course, the Black Lives Movement, which started in 2014, so it's been going on for a long time, but also in connected with the, with the protests in Hong Kong and elsewhere. Um, the, I would want to come up with a term, a translation is good, but I wonder if it's something like insurrectional affiliations uh, or, 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 or something else about the way in which these are connected and influence each other and, and provide um, inspiration also uh, to each other in a way. I think there's a way in which I think that the uprisings about the killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor sparked renewed energy within the uh, Adama Traora uh, uh, movement in France, for instance, you know. Um, quickly, I wanted to get back to you, Emmanuel, on this before, and Adam, maybe you'll be able to connect what you were gonna say to the next part of our discussion, which is gonna be um, on, on, the, on the economic precipice that is connected, of course, with all of this. But yes, go ahead, Emmanuel. Uh, you, you I shared the screen. Do you yeah. see that? Yes, yeah, yeah. This picture yeah, well. extremely interesting, extremely telling, right? This is a picture taken in Paris. So this is in English, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Racism is also a pandemic. So it, it, there might be no text, but there is a, a there is a language, right? And it's it's and and you know she has like at BLM or right? hashtag BLM at the at the bottom of her of her yeah. uh, of her sign. So there is a there is a language which is English and 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 so it's not a complete translation, right? It's it's not an absolute translation. There's still a reference to the U.S. I am very mindful of time. I know we have tons of things to say. I would like to say one thing. At mm -hmm. the end of the day, I think um, you know all these movements. Uh, you have them in France with the, the you know, the committee uh, Verité pour, uh, pour Adama, with, which has been led, and it's not a, it's not by chance, but uh, created and led by his sister, mm -hmm. Asa Traoré, uh, and, and in the very much the same way, I think that BLM has been, uh, I mean, a lot of women have been, had a very important role in the creation of uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, Black Lives Matter in the U.S., uh, but uh, and then you have this young woman in the you know in the in the uh, in, in in that picture. But what I what I want to say that uh, uh, at the end of the day, in France, in Britain, in Germany, in Spain, in the U.S., uh, what is common here that beyond this uh, language, which is you know English, beyond this history that has you know and those references of slavery and. Uh, very specific American situation. I think everybody recognizes that there is, uh, you know, that the 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 the, um, the um, accounts of of colonization and slavery have not been settled, right? So in France, a very important group is the Afro Caribbean uh, group uh, of people living in uh, in Paris have been very active, not just African people, immigrants from Africa, but also people from, from the Caribbean. There is, you know, there is this consciousness that I think has uh, come to the fore. I mean, all the movements against the statues uh, uh, and, and, you know, and the movement for reparation, which is also very strong in France. So there is this, I think, you know, at the bottom of this a kind of international conscious of, an, of a global history, right? Uh, one thing that I, I think is really important to say is that the, the pandemic has, um, I think, given a new meaning to the notion of systematic racism or systemic racism, right? Which is not just uh, lodged in representations, but also in, um, the exposure of people to some kind of risk to you know the the, the difference between the, the the you know the mortality between different population uh, i think has been essential the, the 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 connections between the economic the social um the urbanistic dimension of racial uh, discrimination not just the police violence but all these dimensions have become very clear in the context of the pandemic and i think it's uh, you know no chance that uh, that um uh, uh, Black Lives Matter has re-emerged as a, as a global movement, uh, one could also say there is a very long history of connections between movement, right from Du Bois' uh, color line and the Congress of African uh, Af African intellectuals or black intellectuals uh, to, you know, to uh, MLK and his connections with South African movements to uh, Black Panthers and the anti-colonial movement in Algeria. I mean, this is not, this is not new. There is a long history of those of those connections. And uh, another thing that I wanted to say before I uh, leave uh, the floor to Adam, I would like to insist on the role of women in all of this, just, you know, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's remarkable 
uh, about what it says in terms of, 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 of new forms of um, politicization that are more horizontal, more demotic, more uh, um, democratic maybe, right? Uh, less like, movement that are, I mean, like Black Lives Matter with less hierarchical, uh, more organized in terms of network than in terms of, you know, party. And I think uh, that's an important dimension uh, you find this also in the environmental, uh, you know, in, in movement that put lives <laughs> at the center of their preoccupations. Uh, and and uh, you see that also in terms of the, the, the people who support, right? I am struck when I walk in the Upper West Side uh, around Colombia by those elderly white ladies holding signs every night saying Black Lives Matter and at, uh, uh, calling for people to hunk, right? Yeah. To manifest, yeah. to perform yeah. a sense of community, right? Those are very old white ladies. And, you know, five years ago, this movement was a French movement, right? Clinton, uh, Clinton, uh, uh, I mean, Hillary Clinton could not even say Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter right? She could not say it in the context of the of the of the election. Uh, she had to say all lives matter, right? And so now you have something that has become maybe not ma mainstream, but that, that has uh, you know diffused through um, different uh, different uh, uh, strata of, of 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 international, let's say, opinion. Uh, and I think it would be, you know, a lot of work to demonstrate this, but I think women have had a very important role, uh, pr 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 yeah. predominant role in that. Yes. Thanks, Emmanuel, and thanks for emphasizing that and the non-hierarchical nature of these uh, movements. Oh. Yes, completely. Um, Adam, I wanted uh, quickly, I wanted to ask you to, uh, you had a two finger, but I was going to take you to the economic point as well. Um, so go ahead and, and move us to that, which is really, I mean, trying to think about the economic implications of this and the pandemic, of course, and on, on geopolitics. Uh, well, thank, thank you. And, and, and um, thank you to everyone for organizing this fascinating event and to Etienne for um, everything that he's provided over his lifetime to us, summarized in these volumes and most recently in, in the essays published on AOC that that formed a kind of backdrop for this conversation. On the on the Black Lives Matter point, I just simply wanted to add the the comment that I think one also has to recognise the extent to which, specifically in Europe, perhaps the um, mobilisation around Black Lives Matter is also a discourse on America and American power, irreducibly for all of the resonances it generates within Europe. Um, specifically perhaps in the countries where African colonialism has left less traces um, in the present. Um, I think there is an element of this conversation which is about America, about American power, about American crisis, and it's the profound uneasiness which this generates all over the world at this moment. And this has a history, and of course, the, the sort of malign label for this is anti-Americanism, which is profoundly unhelpful because obviously these are movements of solidarization with Americans. But, the, but all the way back to the, at least the 1960s and the original civil rights moment, as for instance, particularly in Germany, which is the European country other than the UK I know best, there has been this complex field of resonances between radicalized politics in Germany and the US around this issue and affiliations which go back half a century. And to me as a historian, it does seem to me that that half century frame that Etienne evokes is the appropriate one for thinking about our current moment. The, the bracket which um, the task, as it were, Bernard, that you assigned to me was this question of what is the relationship between the current economic crisis and geopolitics? And it's, we don't have time here to, as it were, unpick the macroeconomics. So I thought what I would use as a sort of way in was the term geopolitics rather than the economic side, because it strikes me that it's, it's quite remarkable that in this kind of conversation amongst us, these sorts of folks, that term should have, as it were, <laughs> the sort of slightly naturalized anchoring function that it does. And as recently as five years ago, certainly 10 years ago, I think it would have been profoundly problematic to use that framing. It doesn't strike us that way right now. And I wanted to sort of pause to reflect on that and what might be at stake in it, because we clearly are witnessing a powerful charging up of the geopolitical field. But I think rather than taking that as a category of analysis and frame, we ought to think about what lies behind that. And to just sort of help us to denaturalize it, I think it's very helpful to go to the point which Etienne 
threw into the conversation, which was the way in which rather than, as it were, the, 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 the virus and the crisis mapping the world in terms of states and powers, it also, as it were, invokes and yet then also in some ways refutes the notion of humanity on the one hand, and humanity is both object and subject of history, which remains a sort of a, a kind of an ideal a, 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 and yet a sort of a will of the wisp, a mirage. And then I also help, can't help myself coming from my German background, thinking about another category, which was the category of, you know, the people like Jürgen Habermas liked to like, used to like, which is the category of global domestic policy. And in some sense, it seems to me that geopolitics, to put it in a nutshell, may be a way of evading the challenge of global domestic policy for potential losers of the global domestic policy game. And to just put that in a nutshell and to bring it back to the question that I think is tied to the geopolitical question, which is the question of America, just two data points, did a rough calculation today. And as of the current moment, the death rate from COVID in China is 180 times better than the death rate in the United States and the clock is ticking. That is adjusted for population. And the comparison with France is barely, you know, is hardly any more flattering. It's 142 times worse in France than it is in China. And the other data point that I wanted to put into the, into the discussion, and this speaks to Emmanuel's very kind remarks earlier on, which is the thing I can't stop thinking about right now, is that yesterday in the virtual Gen United General Assemblies meeting, Xi Jinping of China committed his country to net zero by 2060. And I would take that as markers of the fact that the global domestic policy game is a terrain, as it were, that major power players in the West think they're probably already losing and have lost now, as it were, dramatically and with, in a style that has immediate repercussions for Western societies to function and indeed for their economies in their existing mode to flourish, to make profit, to accumulate, to go on perpetuating the status quo. And I think there is a fundamental set of questions on the minds now of extremely heavy hitting managers of global capital. There is an alliance of um, fund managers, asset managers, the notorious big guys, the black rocks of this world, to the tune of $47 trillion, which is demanding from 161 major corporate climate criminals, in other words, the, the private Western corporations responsible for emissions, that they sign up to neutrality by 2050. And this includes the Exxons, the Chevrons of this world, under the cosh of a kind of self-constituting gazamp capitalist on the behalf of $47 trillion worth of asset management, demanding a climate response, in part, of course, because they cannot count on that coming from Western governments. And they're not doing this out of the kindness of their souls or their commitment to that evanescent humanity. They're doing it because there's otherwise quite difficult to see how you secure the long-term reproduction of a portfolio, a highly diversified portfolio of $47 trillion. Because somewhere in that portfolio, you are going to suffer absolutely crippling damage from one or other of the anthropocenic crises coming down the pike. That same coalition was also very interested in IP sharing when it came to vaccines, because they know very well that without the vaccine, we don't get forward. So I think that's, I think for me, the question is, what is the geopolitical term doing here? And to me, it feels like, it is a question that's being forced on us, but I wonder about the motives of the people doing that and the suddenness with which that's, that term has asserted itself and its extraordinary alienness, both to radical progressive discourse on the one hand and to mainstream liberalism as recently as 10 years ago. So that, to the extent that the geopolitical question is posed, I think we have to ask what are the, what are the essential, what are the preconditions that force that onto the agenda? Because Beijing wants to play the global domestic policy competition game. And, um... And is doing so pretty well. Uh, and 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 you and you put on the table usefully these other questions that we're also going to be addressing uh, of the of the public health systems, right, which are at the core of what you were suggesting in terms of the uh, political uh, comparisons and of course climate change, which is looming uh, over all of these topics, uh, both the pandemic and also the 
the, 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 the relationship to systemic racism. Etienne, Etienne did you want to uh, follow up on, on what uh, Adam was suggesting? Yes, it's, yes. So much kind of picking yes. up on certain yes. concepts that you yes. have. Developed. Yes, I want to try. Um, uh, of course, my expertise in, in, in these matters is, uh, <laughs> compared to Adam's, is uh, like, uh, I would say, uh, China's death rate compared to the U.S. Uh, death rate. I mean, it's a proportion of one to 100 or whatever. But still, um, thank you for bringing in, uh, first of all, uh, this category of the... Um, of the uh, global or world uh, uh, domestic uh, uh, policy, uh, uh, which you attributed to Habermas, and I agree because he used it extensively, borrowed it from a former German uh, writer in German, Weltinnenpolitik. Uh, uh, this is, of course, an absolutely excellent uh, 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 category, and allow me to. Um, uh, um, indicate three uh, points of very different uh, style. Um, first of all, um, um, yes, I w I w the, the, we feel more than ever because of a number of reasons, of course, but uh, particularly the uh, ecological catastrophe, uh, which uh, everybody understands now, and this is deeply disturbing, especially for the people who are most directly uh, um, exposed to, to the effects, is, uh, is, is something that will not take place in the future, but uh, uh, is already taking place now, or better said, took place before, uh, uh, more or less uh, <laughs> long before, and whose effects are now developing in a manner that we uh, uh, are not sure we can cope with. Uh, so uh, uh, California is burning, as Australia was burning, the Amazon uh, uh, as well. There are human and uh, political factors there that are very uh, uh, visible in, in, in the present. And there are other aspects. And of course, the pandemic uh, uh, adds to this uh, uh, feeling that what we need is not only a global policy, I mean, that. I would say the majority, 99% of the population in the world who are not uh, uh, likely to take refuge in that. They have plans for that, of course, the 1% uh, in some uh, uh, highly guarded, protected and, 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 uh, and, and best equipped uh, uh, places. Uh, what we need is a, is a, is a, is a, is a, is a global, is a, is a, our, our global solutions and global programs and global regulations, as I tried to say, uh, using a common word uh, in the uh, final essay of my uh, book that you quoted last time, uh, 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 Bernard. Uh, so, so, uh, uh, so a politics done by uh, uh, the human, by, by by mankind for mankind. Uh, but uh, and and in that sense, it's uh, such uh, um, uh, iconic uh, phrases or sentences as the common house, uh, which is becoming a hot house, uh, uh, acquire a very direct and 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 and, and powerful meaning. But then, of course, immediately uh, what comes immediately to the to the fore is the question of uh, who inhabits that uh, common house uh, and what kind of capacity do they have to act together in, to, in the same direction and in the common uh, 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 interest. And here, of course, what uh, come to, to, comes to the fore uh, more than ever uh, is the, uh, are the divisions, the, 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 the conflicts, uh, and, and the huge inequalities, uh, 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 which are so many obstacles, in fact, to that, uh, to that uh, common action. And, and the, the way in which they are going to be overcome uh, uh, in the direction that we, I have to, to, to say my, 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 myself, despite Despite my old uh, internationalism that I, <laughs> I never lose, or the conviction I share with Habermas and others that uh, 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 we have become world uh, uh, citizens, I have no clear idea of how this will, uh, uh, this will uh, uh, proceed. Uh, so, um, uh, in the notes I had prepared, more or less, for the discussion, but which I leave aside, I, I had written somewhere, internationalism 
is at a historic low point in in today's world. So I'm I'm not sure if you agree with that. So, but in the very um, this is my feeling. I mean, the very moment in which we we need it more than ever. Uh, and uh, I don't see it, of course, as a kind of uh, uh, all people uh, <laughs> kiss, uh, <laughs> kissing everybody, etc. But as a as a as a as a drive, I would say, as a force in the, in 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 the contemporary world, this this is at an ever low point. Uh, and the change in the geopolitical uh, uh, relationship of forces. I mean, the fact that is now absolutely evident uh, that the U.S. is no longer the hegemon. Uh, or perhaps we will, I don't know if we wish we had time to return to the question of the, uh, to the monetary question, of course, because this seems to be, to remain more than ever, of course, the strong uh, 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 point uh, of the American uh, uh, hegemony, because Roughly speaking, the dollar is is the is the money of the world, and uh, and and the U.S. Uh, um, uh, uh, create that uh, that uh, that, uh, that that money. But otherwise, this hegemony is over, even militarily, apparently in the last uh, etc. Huh? So a new hegemon is rising. Uh, and the West in which we live is full of prejudices and wrong representations uh, ab about that uh, 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 that uh, hegemon and and how it works internally and 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 externally. But the fact, as such, of course, doesn't I I I, I believe provide a solution for the world uh, 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 today. So that's uh, uh, why, of course, while being uh, extremely uh, uh, very strongly aware that this is only a limited part of the problem. I always thought and I remain convinced that internationalism or the force that would uh, 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 crystallize, I would say, a policy that is domestic for the world uh, uh, can, um, cannot be only uh, uh, coming from the top. I mean, I, I don't neglect that. I, I, I'm not a, an anarchist, a spontaneous, get rid of the states. Uh, we don't need them. We need them more than ever, uh, not whichever state. Uh, and the institutions and the, and the, and the uh, uh, World Health Organization and, and financial uh, regulation. We need that, but if there is no, uh, 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 if the peoples, uh, if the, however you you call them, I mean the the, the uh, 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 do not express their 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 their. Their, their intentions and and their needs and and their and their and and invent something. Uh, 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 this low point will uh, will go even lower, and that's uh, and I, I I must finish, but I take only one example, which I, I believe is concrete and in and uh, uh, connects the 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 different aspects, uh, because we are in the pandemic. Okay, so let's. Put this at the at the at the for the forefront, uh, and everybody talks about vaccines. Uh, vaccine. Do you say vaccine in English? Vaccines. Yes. Yeah. Vaccines. Uh, vaccine. Mm -hmm. So nobody knows exactly when uh, and if the vaccine is 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 coming. But uh, this is part of the of the of the of the of, uh, of the solution, of course. So our president Macron, that uh, uh, I think Bashir <laughs> was mentioning. Uh, Poet contra <laughs> a moment ago in the middle of uh, the, 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 the crisis of the French health systems a uh, uh, few few months a few weeks ago had this remarkable phrase. He said, uh, 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 "Not everything must be uh, uh, ruled by the market. The laws of the market. Vaccines are common good." for all the humans, and therefore they must be produced, distri distributed, and available on the basis of that commonality or commonwealth. Uh, so is that going to take place in the next, uh, 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 in the coming uh, weeks or, or, or months? You can have your doubts, uh, you can have your doubts. But it's also not, uh, uh, I would say, an acceptable position to simply say this will depend on uh, 
how much the new Chinese uh, he hegemon can impose uh, uh, of its uh, uh, logics, which are not purely commercial, but are also in, uh, imperialist, uh, etc. Or uh, uh, how much the United States can buy with their uh, monetary uh, uh, privilege, or which kind of uh, 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 alliance the European Union can secure with uh, big pharmaceutical uh, uh, firms in the in, in, in the world. The question of vaccine as a common as a as a, as a as a common good or as a common necessity is on the table and it is on the table for the peoples of the of the of the world this is a global domestic uh, uh, issue in the immediate present mm -hmm. and, and the amazing thing at etienne is that blackrock put that issue on the agenda so okay. insofar as there is an entity speaking for the collective interest of capital, it formulated an agenda very analogous to that. Obviously, out of the profit motive, so as to maximize return on its giant portfolio, but it actually produced the kind of functional imperative to produce that, produce mm -hmm. that solution. Yeah, and so and we're we're about to get there for the third part, which has to do with public health systems, how we've how how the pandemic has um uh, affected our conception of uh, public health systems in the different countries and about the communal fabric of societies and how that's been transformed by the pandemic. And I'm going to ask Bashir to get to that and then Emmanuel to, to respond as well. But Adam, um, you kind of, you punted a little bit. And so I want a little bit more from you because, um, because, because I mean, you, you talked about the public health systems and you talked about climate change, both of which are directly related to economic growth and questions of stagnation that are, that are, that are the kind of result of this pandemic. I mean, the effects of growth and, and potential stagnations. And you didn't specifically address that. And I just wanted to hear one word or, or, or a few thoughts about that. In other words, how, how, is, the, how is the shock, this shock, uh, likely to play out if you have any if, if you have any thoughts on that I, I mean I punted in part because it just isn't the space and the time or at this point it's simply too early to tell mm -hmm. um, so it seems important just to acknowledge that perhaps the thing to say and it goes back to something that that uh, Emmanuel was emphasizing at the beginning that it's not obvious in fact it seems to me that we have the right words to describe prospective futures at this moment I mean, are we looking at a crisis in the sense of Lehman 2008? Probably not. Um, are we looking at something that we would describe as a sort of great depression? Depression might be a better word because the, what we might be entering is more like a condition, but that term is so heavily freighted with historical resonances of the 1930s that I think it doesn't help us any further. It might be particularly appropriate also because of all of the depression everyone is feeling. Well, well, well maybe, maybe, but I think we would have to re you know, we would have to reinvent what it meant. Larry mm. Summers, of course, again, from the very heart of, as it were, the intellectual establishment of, of economics, has been talking for some time about secular stagnation. But in a sense, that is a model which sits too comfortably within a growth framework. It is essentially a kind of um, steady state, you know, the return of a sort of classical economics of a steady state in which growth simply converges to, to zero at a very high level of income. Um, and it may be that we need a new set of, I was literally talking to one of the editors at the FT yesterday about what would be the appropriate word for the condition that we're in. And it's, the economists came up with this notion of the 90% economy. So it's like a kind of it's like an amputation, like an economy with a phantom limb problem where, you know, the a huge part of the person to person service sector just goes missing with huge implications for particularly women's work. A vast Was that 19 of or 90? 90. 90, 90, which currently looks a little 90. optimistic. That's so a little bit, be, I would think. Yeah. And it depends very much to speak about the global hierarchy, what you're talking about, right? So South Africa is estimating unemployment might surge to 50%. We're talking about a decade crisis, a decadal crisis in Latin America in, in particular, where they have suffered a combination of financial and, and, and pandemic shocks. So those pieces are being rearranged. And I think, you know, where you could actually, to pick up one of Etienne's points, talk about internationalism as a truly active and dynamic force, and it would need a new history, 
would be China's engagement both with African countries, sub-Saharan African countries in particular, and with Latin America at this moment. Because if face fast diplomacy hasn't worked in Europe, it definitely is working in Latin America. Mm -hmm. um, and but of course, it isn't the it isn't the Mao era in Chinese internationalism of the 1960s, which was a very considerable presence, say in Tanzania or somewhere like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a more corporate. Uh, technologically driven one belt one road vision of internationalism but there is a cohort of emerging market youth students intellectuals specialists and Chinese actors who are shaping a new if it's not an internationalism it's a new kind of community anyway which cuts across the old divides and is no longer centered on the universities of Britain France and the United States mm -hmm. and that I think will be a very interesting formation sociologically as well and with right. considerable yeah. political consequences yeah yeah definitely forged in this crisis amongst other things right um, right thank you Adam yeah no that was really helpful um and we would need to be a little bit more uh clear about what the percentage is I think ultimately right um because I think it's wouldn't like, we all like to know yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. no I mean you know um, yeah. all right so um so and and so the we we were uh, talking about the public health systems and the and the and the effect on 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 communities and 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 communal relations and so I wanted to go to that Bashir for the third point um before we address some of the questions which some of the questions have to do with the concept of translation. So we'll come back to that um, in the in the question and answer. But um, Bashir, did you could you uh, could you kick us off on the on the third set of questions, which had to do with what what the pandemic has revealed about our public health systems in different countries and about the communal fabrics of society? Yeah, let me let me do that by talking about African public health systems Thank and uh, reminding us all that at the beginning when everything started and it was not yet in Europe and in America. There was all these alarmist, catastrophist discourses about Africa being again threatened by the next African disaster. The idea was that the public health system were so fragile, which they are, that this continent was probably going to be wiped out by this disaster. And there was so uh, some so not so secret uh, 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 reports. Uh, in, in the West, uh, uh, you know, saying that what is likely to happen on the African continent with that is that we would have uh, uh, popular protests and that these states, which are all fragile, many of them are going to collapse. Basically, it was going to be chaos. And on top of that, and in connection with what we uh, first said about racism, on top of that, you had a, a very tranquil racist discourse that came out of French television when two doctors, eminent researchers, just said, one of them said, it may be provocative to say that, that's anytime you start with that kind of sentence, or I know it is not politically correct, but you are going to say something very stupid. And it, it did not uh, uh, miss this time. So they say, we should be uh, conducting a few tests about some BCG vaccine at that time in Africa where they have no masks, where they have no treatment, etc., and adding just the way we did with uh, uh, prostitutes when we were trying some things about AIDS. And this was universally denounced as the kind of racism. The interesting thing is that the, the, the way, the very matter of fact way in which these people who were discussing uh, among themselves on French television just assumed that what Africa had to bring on the table was, as usual, its population, mm -hmm. its very demographics. Uh, since they are going to uh, undergo catastrophe anyway, let's make the trials and the test over there. Now, what happened? It turns out that until now, and one has to be very prudent and say until now, Africa is doing better than uh, 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 basically the rest of the of the world. Of course, if you count, if you do not count South Africa, which is an interesting case, because South Africa is, I think, number three or four right now in terms of the cases and the, and the, and the death. But Africa, the continent where the catastrophe was uh, uh, expected, uh, did not uh, have that. Of course, again. How do you explain that? That's one interesting question. People mention the conditions. This is a continent where the, the, the youngest continent in terms of the 
of the uh, the age of its population, etc. Uh, that's uh, that's true, but uh, one should not ignore the uh, measures that have been taken. First of all, many African countries, actually the majority of them, followed the science. They were listening to the WHO. I, uh, uh, of course, today people are saying the WHO uh, did this or that, had this wrong, is too uh, obedient to, to China, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But they represent multilateral universal science. And as the science was progressing, because we are in these pandemics, we are also in the situation where we are witnessing science being done with all the conjectures and refutations that go with science. To to come back to Karl Popper's. Uh, 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 language here and terminology. So science can say today something and say something different the next day. We have all been witnessing this, but the African uh, states listen. So let me take the example of the country I know better, which is, which is my country, which is uh, 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 Senegal. Senegal was able to create national consensus. In other words, Macky Sall just called all the political parties and say, okay, Let's have some national consensus about very harsh measures that we have to take, but we do need to take them. And all the political parties agreed at first with him. When you know Senegal, you know, Senegal is a country where if someone says that the sun rises in the East, you are sure somebody is going to say, well, what about the West? But in this case, they all came together and agreed on having curfew, harsh curfew for, for some time, Something much more important, probably also. In terms of religion, one of the fear was that uh, religious manifestations and celebrations and festivals are going to just give uh, the coronavirus what it likes, that is to say, density. Well, actually, the interpretation of uh, the religion, in particular of the Quran, or by the way, of the teaching of, of the Christianity also, was to say, well, we have in this case to follow science and there are uh, traditions about what to do if a pandemic happened. There is a particular hadith in, the, in, in Islam that I was asked to quote and comment in back home. I wrote a few things about that. Basically saying that if a pandemic, if the plague happens somewhere, don't go there. And if you are already there, don't go out. I mean, an epidemiologist wouldn't say that. Basically, this was the, the, the kind of discussion that happened in the society itself to the point when, where the state said, now we have uh, better figures, so we might reopen the mosques. Many mosques say, well, thank you very much, but we are not reopening. We did not close because you told us so, but because our religion told us to do that. And we are not reopening, but because you are saying that, but we are trying to wait until it is really, really safe. So that kind of discourse, people don't know about, about it, but that is what happened in Africa to counterbalance the fact that, of course, you do not have enough ICU beds. Of course, you do not have enough doctors. Of course, you do not have enough nurses. That is to say you have fragile uh, health systems that could be overwhelmed very quickly. But the response, not just of the state apparatus, but also of the population is something that is full of lessons and that should be known better. By the way, in terms of information, there was recently a, a, a compilation made by a foreign policy magazine. They just picked up 36 countries and uh, uh, mixing up wealthy, rich countries and not so wealthy, poor countries and looked at what they did during the pandemics and how well they did. Among the 36, Senegal came second in terms of the good responses. Just to mention, uh, uh, um, United States came 31st uh, mm. in, that, in that ranking. Of course, this is a ranking which is anecdotal. You did not hear about it probably, although it was reported in USA uh, uh, Today, which is a newspaper I only read when I travel and I can't find any other newspaper, but it was there and USA Today, I think, is widely read. Mm -hmm. What I'm uh, going, the direction I'm taking this towards is to say that lessons have been learned 
in, during this time in, when we look at health systems. What we were expected to happen until now has not happened where we thought it would happen. Nobody knows what is going to happen now in Africa, especially if there is a second wave. Uh, we, we don't know. We don't even know why it is truly at bottom uh, uh, that Africa did not so bad as it was expected uh, 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 to do. But uh, uh, what we are being told here by this pandemic is that all countries matter, to use the phrase we used earlier. All countries were facing this with their own means and they had different results. But this kind of mobilization of all the forces that people have, starting to have all these tailors in the so-called informal sector making masks, competing in making the best possible masks that would protect you but allow you to, 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 to breathe. Uh, uh, all the capacity of innovation, not to actually mention also the, the, the human resources. I mean, we have a great director of the Institut Pasteur in Dakar, who happens to be my cousin, great uh, um, scientist uh, who, who, who worked on a, on a very good test. And in Senegal, you, 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 you can have tests through that Institut Pasteur and have your results in 24 hours, by the, by the way. So these are things that need to be taken into account. The second big lesson, and this connects to what we said economically earlier with Adam. Uh, uh, until now, there was some Afro-optimism about the fact that Africa was now the emerging continent and that uh, it was the next frontier of uh, uh, global capitalism and so on and so forth. And the, the, the rates of growth were measured. My own country, Senegal, was beyond 7% and heading upwards, etc. Now it is almost in recession. It is 1.1%. And it is probably already under 0%, so in, in, in recession. So what we are discovering is that those figures of emerging nations, etc., are totally meaningless when the question becomes the question of life or death. So the whole neoliberal discourse has to be reoriented now around the notion of human development and mm -hmm. around the notion of an alternative, a different uh, uh, thinking about growth and, 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 and development, about what Etienne just called earlier uh, 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 common, common good, and not everything is the market or uh, uh, rate growth. And I hope that that lesson will be understood when we live again, hopefully, in a post-COVID uh, 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 world and that it will uh, uh, appear in our own discourse about what development is. Thank you, Bashir. So um, I, I, I did want to get uh, Emmanuel's take on this, uh, in part because, I mean, we've heard, Bashir, you were telling us so much about lessons learned. And by contrast, in the West, it really seems as if what we've had instead is the politicization uh, of, uh, of the pandemic. And the politicization is reflected in the in the inability of many uh, public uh, health systems to, to respond or actually being crippled in the process, intentionally crippled in the process. And I mean, I think we've seen, definitely seen that in the United States, but we've seen the politicization elsewhere as well. I mean, in Germany and France as well. And so, um, uh, Emmanuel, I wanted to hear you on that for a moment. Um, and, but I do want to get also to the questions. And so just to, just to prefigure where we're going, uh, the two, we, we have four, set, four questions, but they, they break out into two themes. One of them has to, brings us back to the, to the notion of translation uh, or uh, in uh, Alexander Miller suggests transduction um, and notions of uh, trans individuality. But so, it would be helpful, I think, maybe when we turn to the to these questions to try and work on two concepts. One is this concept of translation that Bashir proposed, and Etienne, maybe you'll guide us with some conceptual work to think about this, how these movements uh, are related. And then the second one goes back to the global domestic policy that Adam Tooze was raising. Uh, two of those questions, I think, address that. So we'll come back to that. Why don't you, uh, Emmanuel, finish us off a little bit with this, with this final third part here? 
Okay, thank you. Um, actually, uh, I'm going to <laughs> finish you off, right, with, with a question maybe to the three of, uh, of you, Etienne, uh, Bashir, and Adam, and trying to bring together some of what you've said in the past uh, 30 minutes. I was actually struck by Bashir's, um, um, if I understood you well, Bashir, by kind of, you know, um, a most nostalgic call for a 4D state, right? So you have a state that has a national system, health system that is able to, um, in, collaboration, in collaboration with the civil society, to try to, you know, tame the, the epidemics because it has a strong, you know, institute pastor, strong belief in science and an ability to, you know, to kind of um, uh, uh, make people, make people, uh, 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 follow their best interest, right? Their individual best interest uh, uh, together. And then, and then, uh, 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 Etienne, you were mentioning something maybe even more in your paper than in your oral comments about this decisive moment of neoliberalism, right? That at the same time seems to seems to have um, seems to to be eating two walls at the same time, which is that, that I found fascinating. On one hand, you know the the uh, in France at least in the first you know in the in the first moment of the crisis where the public system of health seems to be completely collapsing under you know uh, over uh, sub being oversubscribed and, and so on and so forth and you say that you know basically the neoliberal state sh has shown its limit by gutting from the inside the public system right so not enough beds not enough everything and then so you had an alternative you had an alternative movement of organization which is not a anarchist which is but a different kind of movement of organization just to you know handle the crisis right people who were you know, hospital directors, but also nurses and everybody kind of putting together an alternative kind of health system for the time being, right? So that's one wall that, that the neoliberal state hit. At the same time, the other one is the public debt, right? The in incredibly, I mean, the only solution to the, to the, to the economic crisis generated by COVID was to get into a, econ I mean, in a, a, and I know nothing about, I mean, know so little about economics that I'm, I'm sure I'm describing this in the wrong way, but like the only way to, you know, avoid a complete catastrophe was to go to massive, uh, you know, massive public debt, right? To, to, to finance the, to finance the, 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 the double crisis of, of supply and demand. So that's, that's, that's the two thing. And then, and then this amazing thing that, that, that Adam told us about, which is um, BlackRock, uh, 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 you know, maybe, I mean, in the, in our imagination, at least the uh, instance of, you know, of the, the, the most uh, uh, neoliberal of all neoliberal organizations, right? Of like global financial capital actually being the, the entity, the institution, the organization that is able to articulate a common, a new common, a vaccine, right? We need, and so, which is another way of thinking about obviously the, uh, you know, the, 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 the limit of the neoliberal state, right? The neoliberal state has not been able to, um, Give us tools uh, in a context of, of pandemic. So it, 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 it's, it's like, you know, I, so I don't know if you want to reflect on this. It is too late, I'm sure, to reflect on that, but I'd like to, you know, there is a convergence here of political and economical uh, uh, preoccupations, maybe a political economy, right? To go back to an old category of, 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 of uh, field of questions that. Um, we may want to pursue <laughs> in a different venue because I think seems seems uh, essential to um, to our understanding of the current moment. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. That, those are great questions. We have about ten minutes left. I thought Etienne might want to address or at least respond first, um, and then maybe we can get something from Adam and Bashir. Etienne. Yes. Thank you. I'm delighted not to have the last word. <laughs> So, um, uh, yes, Emmanuel, uh, um, uh, this is a question I've been ruminating for a long time, you know. I'm not a great fan of the, of the category neoliberalism because, uh, I mean, many of us use it uh, continuously. Our students are very fond of it and I understand why. And some of our most intelligent and, 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 uh, and uh, and smart uh, uh, colleagues are, are theorizing uh, on that. What I fear, what I fear, but what 
that's just a question I, I, I want to ask, is that the generalization of the category neoliberalism, which originally, Adam, correct me if I'm uh, uh, wrong, refers to a discourse, an orientation in, uh, in economic discourse, or perhaps, and also, of course, in the e economic policies, becomes a substitute for a thorough analysis of the kind of capitalism in which we uh, uh, live today. So, of course, as a, as, a, as, a, as a philosopher, I have a dangerous tendency to throw into the, <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, open or, or, or the public resounding uh, uh, speculative formulas uh, such as absolute capitalism, which in fact I did not invent. Uh, but uh, uh, okay, so but uh, uh, to make a long story short, the, the problem, the dilemma that you stressed, which I have in mind, is the following if you look at and i agree that this is specific this is our specific case and uh, cases uh, if you look at the european uh, 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 welfare states uh, which i uh, called uh, uh, um, uh, national social <laughs> uh, states i create as they were created uh, um, uh, Along the uh, 20th century and uh, got into crisis both internally and because they were violently uh, attacked, in fact, by the new uh, uh, dominant policies. Uh, uh, by after Thatcher, Reagan, and others, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so they seem to be caught, and I agree, and I, I'm sure this is not valid for everywhere, uh, because uh, and the health crisis has has, has put uh, this very uh, clearly to the fore. If only we compare the situation in the United States and the situation in France, for example. Uh, in France, we have a social security system which is relatively uh, uh, good or stable compared to to to. To, to, to others. In the US, uh, a huge majority of people still have to get uh, universal coverage and uh, things which are permanently on the agenda of the, of the uh, or say, I'd say the left of the Democratic Party and, and so on. That makes a difference, of course. And then whether the hospitals are better here or there, I don't know. But the fact is that not everybody has access to the hospitals exactly in the same uh, uh, manner. In any case, the crisis in, in, uh, that erupted in the French, uh, in the middle of the French uh, health system at the beginning of the uh, uh, pandemic, uh, in which the government and etc. for a long time tried uh, to uh, uh, pre present uh, only uh, what, what, they, what, they, what they admitted was the fact that they had not anticipated such a crisis. Uh, uh, which already is questionable because there are uh, uh, possibilities at least to be better uh, uh, prepared. But they, they, so, but in fact, what, uh, what, uh, uh, and they lied to the public and so on and so on. But uh, uh, what to, took place in the fact was the fact that this uh, uh, public uh, health system uh, had been already. Uh, uh, um, uh, squeezed and stretched and uh, and uh, uh, dismantled to some extent uh, resources financial resources beds the number of beds to the, the number of uh, uh, germany uh, uh, didn't have that problem uh, that uh, as we know but france uh, had it to a dramatic uh, uh, extent and 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 therefore of course uh, uh, the effects of neoliberal policies uh, uh, on the on the public uh, on the public service became suddenly uh, 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 obvious and dramatic. Perhaps the worst case of all, I cannot not mention that, I, I repeat in the French uh, 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 case, was the situation of the elderly. I mean, uh, the, because uh, a, a huge uh, uh, amount of uh, institutions uh, devoted to uh, taking care of the elderly and there are social processes here that are also very heavily uh, uh, weighing, uh, we're now in private Institutions where the uh, logic was purely uh, 
financial. That is also true for Germany and, and, and other countries in, in, in Europe. And so I'm not talking of a, a massacre, etc. but the, the death rates were huge and, and the conditions above all, uh, absolutely in, inhuman. So you're witnessing the effects of these neoliberal policies. But on the other hand, and that's, I, I finish with that, this is part of the uh, 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 dilemma, neoliberal politics need uh, uh, in such countries as uh, uh, France, uh, 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 people who are who can afford either directly or indirectly through their taxes and 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 the state services, I would say health uh, uh, services and 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 and, and treatments which are uh, uh, costly and are at a relatively high uh, level. So it's absolutely contradictory to reduce uh, uh, the mass of the of the population by austerity policies to uh, uh, conditions of uh, of uh, um, uh, misery of poverty, and on the other hand, want to 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 sell a, a, a high uh, level and 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 and, and costly uh, uh, services. This is like a fork. Huh? Now, like the, the the thing that you mentioned, and I also ins insisted of on that, of course, is very important and is not going to disappear because uh, in the middle of that crisis, of course, what also came uh, to became manifest, and even the head of state. Uh, had to speak about that, etc., was the extent to which this health service absolutely needed the daily services of nurses, cleaning uh, uh, lady, many of them uh, migrant women, uh, <laughs> some of them illegal, even in the public uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the public services. And then, of course, doctors, etc. Again, the doctors, this is very interesting. There are so many, such an important part in the urgency, uh, in the emergency services who are foreign doctors coming from uh, uh, abroad, and they don't have the same status. So all these inequalities proved to be a point of uh, breaking uh, and collapsing of the uh, system. And suddenly everybody was saying, this cannot last. This cannot last. We're going to fix that. Huh? And if you have a broader view, you think that not only you have to fix that, but you have to invent, and I follow very much Bashir on that, new regimes of biopolitics, as Foucault would say, or health uh, 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 organizations for the, 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 the present and the and, and the future. And in fact, uh, within three uh, uh, weeks or, or one month, uh, after some negotiations, etc., it was again uh, uh, put into the the, the 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 drawer, and the politicians are are, are talking about uh, 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 other things. But the second wave is coming uh, because this pandemic is not uh, uh, finished, and all these uh, 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 people are more than ever, of course, uh, 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 in, 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 in a situation of, of stress. So the crisis of the health system is something that concerns everybody in a society. Uh, the health system is not a partial uh, uh, system. It's the reproduction of life as, uh, as such, and, and it's what sustains the, the society. And this is Extreme, more uh, uh, true and visible than 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 ever. But this health system really is at a crossroads. Yeah. So thanks, Etienne. I mean, uh, and it, you know, at, at first you criticize the term neoliberalism, which it's easy to criticize. Although when we define it properly in terms of discourses or policies or institutions, duplicitous often in terms of the of what actually is said versus what is done. Um, it does, it, it is a helpful category as you, I think as you yourself were using it in uh, when you continued the conversation very well. One of the big questions that's raised of course now is what is the future of those discourses, policies and institutions uh, and, and how has the pandemic affected uh, the strength and, and weaknesses uh, of neoliberal, uh, of neoliberal ways of speaking uh, right and and of the particular policies and i think that's really that is a that that has been since the beginning a huge question a big topic uh, and to try and understand exactly whether whether maybe may, maybe whether the pandemic would ultimately get us beyond or to a different space or a different relationship to those 
ways of speaking. Now, we're, we, we have run out of time, but I had promised Adam and, uh, and Bashir uh, to, to close us with a few thoughts. Um, we, we, we also had some other great questions that came in uh, just recently. Banu Vargu wrote in and uh, Yanis Tsigakis uh, and, and uh, but so Adam, Bashir, can, do you wanna, do you wanna wrap, wrap up uh, just in a minute and then uh, I'll say some closing words? I, I just add to your, to your uh, Bernard, to your excellent, very brief, as it were, analytic of how one might talk about neoliberalism. I think it's maybe a fifth dimension, which is relation and the balance of class forces and class power that defines its characteristics at any given moment. And for me, this is, as it were, the connecting thread to the element of my contribution that Emmanuel picked up on. The, the situation that we confront, we face us faced with, I think, is on the one hand, um, you know, typical of neoliberalism in that the state, or, you know, it's 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 a dual state model in which half of the time we're operating according to tightly defined legal structures, and then part of the time we're in a zone of emergency and rapid intervention. That has, I think, reached a point which makes the framing in terms of ideological discourses of coherence increasingly difficult. And I think we may be beyond the point of reconfining it within that frame. But the problem, of course, is that the balance of class forces as reconfigured by neoliberalism and its active campaigning version in the 70s and 80s is fundamentally unchanged. And if anything, amplified in its inequalities by this epidemic. So then the question is, what does an unbound state, an unbound form of governance, unconstrained by the platitudes and as it were, the guilty conscience of neoliberalism actually look like de facto? And this of course is of course the terrain on which Frankfurt School analysts develop their analytic of fascism, or at least the political economy of fascism in the case say of Neumann's Behemoth. It's precisely under conditions like this in which, as it were, le liberal legality ceases to effectively bind the functional necessities of reproduction of big capital, that you end up with unmediated clashes of violence, unmediated politics acting out. And that would be another version of Welt in and politic, but of a much, much more brutal kind. And, and in Etienne's piece, the, the, the specter of fascism flashes up. I think a historic fascism is an anachronism in the current moment because I'm too much of a historian. I think it's fed by total war. It's fed by a particular type of early 20th century racism, anti-Semitism, which is no longer actual. But that configuration of class forces is, is very interesting. And so to that extent, as it were, BlackRock kind of interventions are to be expected and, and we should monitor them very closely because that's in a sense where a lot of the action is. And yes. a project of power attached to that kind of aggregation of capital has some prospect of actually realizing itself. Of course, with with, with completely open-ended implications with regard to distribution, both nationally and globally. Yeah, ending it on Neumann's behemoth is quite ominous, but um, so Bashir, <laughs> correct, I think, and, uh, and poignant, uh, but also ominous. Uh, Bashir, will you, will you close for us then? And turn on your mic, please. Turn on your mic, Bashir. I thank people who wrote questions and I try very quickly in a few seconds to answer them very quickly and I'm sorry about being simplistic. First of all, I accept the idea that probably Gilbert Simondon's transduction, transduction because he was writing in French, is probably something that I would like to use also instead of translation to keep the notion of something being transferred. Uh, so that is why G Simondon used transduction because he thought that the prefix trans was a little bit lost in a uh, French tra, but uh, yeah. I accept that. Mm -hmm. uh, second, yeah, uh, questions about uh, uh, translation into the situation of Hong Kong or the Uyghurs. I, I, I believe that that could be done as well because the whole point is actually to, to just refuse the, uh, the, this idea that there is one model of what it means to belong to a nation, to be a citizen of a nation, and everybody has to be assimilated into that model. All the discussion about assimilation and integration as you find it in, in France, for example. So uh, uh, imposition of any model 
is unacceptable. And I think that Black Lives Matter see, means that as well, that uh, uh, shared humanity means that as, as well. So those translations could be, could be, could be made. Uh, uh, and to, to, go, to go further and connect this with a uh, uh, wonderful uh, text in uh, Etienne's writings where he asks us to think about the socialism for the future, for the 21st century. I think that socialism in the 21st century has to come back also to some kind of Jaurès inspiration at first. I'm thinking here of the first editorial of the newspaper L'Humanité written by Jaurès. When he mentioned that the reason why he chose that name was that the goal was to have one humanity. He was not naive about the divisions, inequalities and class struggle as you might call it but we have to have a horizon. And the horizon would be that one humanity he considered to be a humanity of nations reconciled within themselves and reconciled together to come and create humanity. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is that I think this is the direction that rethinking socialism should be headed towards. Socialism is a humanism and humanism is a socialism. And I would love to spend many months to come uh, discussing that with, with Etienne. Mm -hmm. And I'm mentioning this because there was a question about whether or not uh, the goal, the final goal is a post-racial society, human society. Yes, indeed. And the, the anonymous uh, writer who asked that asked if we would reach a point where the color of a man's skin would be as irrelevant as the color of his eyes. And actually this is a song by Bob Marley. Uh, saying until the moment when a man's skin is of no more significant than the color of his eyes, there is war. So Bob Marley would have the final word, word for me. Thank you, Bashir. Thank you. That was the perfect place to end. So um, I just want to join. Uh, Banu Bargu had a question. We're not going to get to the question, but we are going to get to the preface, which is thank you very much to Etienne, Adam, uh, Emmanuel, Bashir, uh, everyone for their remarks concerning the present and, and Banu wrote, it is a helpful reminder that critical thought and community are possible despite the catastrophic circumstances. Indeed, that is the case. Uh, this has been a, a, a wonderful critical a community of critical thought and, and, and practice. And I wanna thank you all. And I wanna thank everyone who's been listening and asking questions and, and uh, and thank you. Thank you, Bernard. You're a dream of a moderator. Thank, thank you, Bernard. You. All right, thank you. Thank you. Merci, so much. Bernard. Uh, adieu. Au revoir.